Hey, it's Greg Brown. Grab your logbook, because it's time for another cockpit adventure from the flying carpet. I'm an aviation author, adventure columnist, photographer, former National Flight Instructor of the Year, and Barnes & Noble Arizona Author of the Month. The flying carpet is a four-place single-engine light airplane. In it, my wife Jean and I have long traveled the North American continent, searching behind clouds for the real America, and experiencing aerial adventures like today's all along the way. Learn more at my website, gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, where you can also see photos from most episodes. And I'd appreciate your feedback in my Flying Carpet Podcast Facebook group. Today's podcast episode regards an interesting flight we made recently to an important to us event in Almogordo, New Mexico. Now that's about a three hour flight from Flagstaff, where we live. And we experienced some things along the way that I think pilots will find very interesting. Those of you who are non-pilots, I'll do my best to explain what's going on here as we talk about this, because it was a rather unusual situation. So climb into the flying carpet, cinch up your seatbelts, and prepare for takeoff on flight number 29, iPads and icing. Clear prop. We'd been looking forward to attending this particular event for quite a long time. We often fly from Flagstaff to Almogordo for various occasions. There are several different factors when flying to Almogordo that make this very interesting. So we're flying from northern Arizona to southern New Mexico down near El Paso. You'll get the most out of this story if you're a pilot, maybe pull out ForeFlight and take a look or Garmin Pilot, whatever you use or a chart, or you can go to my website, gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, and follow the flight there. I'll try and explain this well enough, but I think if you're looking at a picture, it'll make more sense to you. We often fly to Almogordo from northern Arizona. And what you need to know about this trip is several things. First, this is a pretty long flight. It's about three hours normally give or take, depending on winds. And the uh, terrain you're dealing with, northern Arizona and northern New Mexico are largely mountainous. Also, there's a big band of high mountains that runs down the Arizona-New Mexico border almost to El Paso. So regardless of which way you go, you need to fly at about 9,500 feet to stay above the terrain without, without having to dodge mountains the entire way. There are some taller mountains, but they're just occasional, so you, they're not a big factor on the flight. Now, another thing you need to know is that Almogordo is due north of El Paso, about 60 miles, and it is surrounded on both the east side and the west side by restricted military airspace, which civilian aircraft like the Flying Carpet are not allowed to enter. So we can't fly directly southeast from Flagstaff to Almogordo. We either fly east to just south of Albuquerque and then make a 90-degree right turn and fly some 85 miles south, or we fly southeast all the way to El Paso on the Mexican border and then fly through a mile-and-a-half wide corridor 60 miles northeast to Almogordo. So it's a circuitous route, and there are very few landing places along either route. Now, the one where we fly to Albuquerque and then turn south is the shorter of the routes, and it's the way we normally go in good weather. 
Occasionally, if the weather is problematic, then we have to take the southern route where we fly all the way down to El Paso and then go north from there. Now, on this particular occasion, we were to attend an event in El Magordo on Saturday afternoon, and the plan was to fly over on Friday morning and come back on Sunday or Monday. So Friday morning, we got up, and I checked weather, as all smart pilots do before they take off, and there was a big blob of weather sitting over the entire state of New Mexico. Arizona was largely clear, but New Mexico was covered with this weather. Now, several factors made this interesting. There were some thunderstorms, there were some rain showers, but they were pretty much isolated, and the forecasts indicated they would dissipate during the day, so they weren't too alarming. But there were clouds shrouding the whole state of New Mexico. They weren't extremely low. You pilots will know the term marginal VFR. Most of these stations, the, the cloud bases were reported anywhere from about 1,000 feet above ground up to 3,000. The challenge was that this flight occurred in fall, and the freezing level was about 9,000 feet above sea level. So I mentioned earlier that normally we have to make this flight on either route at at least 9,500 feet, sometimes higher. The freezing level's at 9,000, and given the varying cloud levels down below, our options would be to either fly underneath the clouds, dodging mountains and potentially lower clouds, which would be extremely dangerous in that mountainous area, so it's out of the question, or to fly up high on an instrument clearance, which allows aircraft to fly in clouds where pilots can't see the ground. The problem we faced that Friday morning was that we needed to be at at least 9,500 to easily clear the terrain safely on either route, but the freezing level is about 9,000. So if the clouds extended up above 10 or 11 or 12,000, even on an instrument clearance, we couldn't go because we would be in potential icing conditions. Now, for you non pilots, if you've ever driven on a highway in the wintertime, when there is freezing fog or snow falling or sleet, you know how ice can coat your windshield and your car and it can be quite dangerous. Well, this happens on airplanes also when you're in the clouds or any type of precipitation. And light airplanes like the flying carpet, we have no way to get rid of that. If ice accumulates on the plane, it gets heavier, it creates drag, and it is a very, very dangerous thing. So we avoid icing conditions like the plague in light airplanes. So here's our problem. I decided immediately we were not going to take our northern route across to Albuquerque and then turn right and fly south to Almogordo because the terrain was high that entire way and there's almost no airports we could land at. And what's more, the weather was reported worse there. So instead, the logical way to go was to fly the southern route via El Paso. We'd be in clear skies to about Silver City, New Mexico. And then from then on, there would be clouds throughout the area. And the question that we faced was, how high were the tops of those clouds? Right? Because I already mentioned we didn't want to fly underneath them. That would be really risky business. So if we're on top of the clouds, we wouldn't get any icing. We'd be in clear skies. But how do you know where the tops of the clouds are? Now, we're going to talk a little about technology here. In the old days, meaning until fairly recently, back before we used electronic tablets to track our progress with GPS, when we were still using paper charts, Pilots would make pilot reports either to Flight Service, which is a weather resource for us that we can radio, or they'd be talking directly to the radar operators at an approach control or en route center frequency. And they would report things like icing and were they on top at a given altitude? Where were the bases of the clouds? 
so that the rest of us who came through later could access that information and make decisions about whether it was safe to proceed or not. Nowadays, because pilots can access real-time weather on their tablet computer, they can grab information about weather at their destination. They can get other information about cloud coverage, about precipitation from their tablet, and so people have pretty much stopped giving pilot reports. Usually that's not a problem, but on a trip like this, it was. So we get up on Friday morning, we're preparing to take off on this trip, and I check weather, I see that this weather all over New Mexico, but I couldn't determine what the cloud tops were in that southern New Mexico area we would need to fly. And therefore, we dared not fly into that area because we'd have to fly a hundred and some miles through or on top of the clouds. And as I mentioned, through the clouds is out of the question. Now, there's another couple factors here. Almogordo being located between these two large areas of restricted airspace is in a very isolated place, and they have one instrument approach allowing aircraft to descend through clouds and land. And that one instrument approach is contained partially in one of the restricted areas that we're not allowed to enter. So over many years of flying there, I had asked, Albuquerque Center, which is the radar controlling authority for civilian aircraft, about this. I had asked Holloman Approach Control, which is at Holloman Air Force Base that is just west of Almogordo. Um, I've talked to quite a few different parties trying to determine, well, if we ever had to fly to Almogordo on instruments, could we do it? And if so, how? One thing I had determined, if we flew the northern route, this is such a remote area that you can't even reach Albuquerque Center by radio without being up over 12,500 feet, meaning you had to have oxygen on and so on. And I could not get a clear answer from anyone as to whether we could get an approach into Almogordo if we needed one. So, in the case of coming from the south, I didn't know if that would be any different but I was concerned about it. So I called our host in Almogordo, told him what was going on. And, and he said, well, if you get down this way and, and you need to shoot an instrument approach to get down through the clouds and you can't get into Almogordo, then you could land at Las Cruces, which would not require dealing with the restricted airspace. And he said, I'll drive an hour and a half and come and pick you up there. So that was a good offer. But we were still faced with flying 80, 90 miles over or through clouds. Now, as I mentioned, these days we use tablet computers to carry all our charts, and it's got our GPS location and weather on it. It's a moving map display, so they're really helpful. And in recent times, we are able to see traffic, other airplanes, on this moving map there has long been a setup where we could get it in the air, which is very helpful for avoiding other traffic and knowing how busy the area is. But we were not able to get this on the ground before. But now it comes right through the internet through Wi-Fi to my iPad. So from my kitchen table, I was watching these various airplanes down in southern New Mexico. And you can click on them and see what they are. And I found out that almost all of them were airline jets flying at very high altitudes. So that suggested to me that we would not be able to go into that area. There was no indication of where the tops might be. So this went on for much of the morning, Friday morning, where I was trying to determine whether to go or not. We had already decided we were not going to try and fly partway and then rent a car and drive if we needed to, because the airports that were outside that cloudy area were all small airports that probably would not have a rental vehicle. So that was out of the question. So the options were figure out if we can safely continue or stay home and consider if we could maybe go Saturday morning before the event. So I'm watching this other traffic, and I thought, well, since nobody's down low, I'm going to telephone Albuquerque Center 
and see if they have any information about tops of the clouds or icing. And I keep in my contact list the supervisor of Albuquerque Center, and that center covers our entire route from northern Arizona to southern New Mexico. So I phoned the uh, supervisor there, and I asked to speak to the sector controller covering this part of southern New Mexico that related to our trip. And I spoke to a, a very nice and accommodating controller there, and she told me that she had nobody flying down low, therefore she had no reports of cloud tops. She did say they had had no icing reports, but of course, there's nobody down low. That doesn't tell you a great deal. So I hung up the phone, and every few minutes I would go back and take another look at air traffic on my iPad. And then I spotted a Bonanza, another light airplane, one of the targets on this screen, watching from my kitchen table, apparently flying into Silver City. And you can tap on these targets and find out what the N number, the registration number, is of the aircraft. So I did that, and once it's, it appeared that the Bonanza had landed at Silver City, I thought, well, I'm going to phone the operation at Silver City and see if I can talk to that pilot and find out what the weather was like. So I made that call, but unfortunately, nobody answered the phone at Silver City, so I couldn't talk to anybody. So some more time passes, and then I notice a Cirrus, another light aircraft, near Las Cruces at 12,500 feet. Now, at the moment I took this next action, I didn't think it was anything unusual or special. But as I talked to pilots since then, including very experienced ones, I realized that I have discovered something useful to us light plane pilots that is not widely done. And it's an integration of new technology with what we've always done. So here's what happened. I see this Cirrus at 12,500 near Las Cruces, which is my initial planned destination if I can't get into El Magordo. And I click on it. I see the end number, the registration number. I phoned Albuquerque Center back and asked to speak to the controller again of that sector. Spoke to the same nice woman there. And I said, hey, I see a Cirrus flying near Las Cruces at 12,500 feet. The end number of this airplane is 12345. Are you talking to that pilot? And if so, can you get me a TOPS report? So she says, I am talking to that pilot, and I haven't asked him for a TOPS report, so hold on. She puts me on hold radios that aircraft, speaks to the pilot, and then she comes back on and she said, the uh, Cirrus pilot says there's no icing. The tops of the clouds are at 8,500 feet, clear above, and the tops are very uniform, meaning they stretch for miles and miles and miles consistently at 8,500 feet. So I thanked her, and based on that information, we packed up the car and headed for the airport because now I knew that if I flew that southern route, got down to Silver City area, I could continue and on top of the clouds at nine or 10 or 11,000 feet, not worry about icing, and I could shoot an instrument approach into Las Cruces, or if I could figure out a way to do it, continue to Almogordo. So we took off from Flagstaff. We headed southeastward through clear skies down towards Silver City. I was a little concerned when we got near Silver City because the base of the clouds was more like 10,000 feet there with tops well above that. So that was concerning to me. But once we got immediately past Silver City, that deck above us went away. 
and one formed below us with the tops, as reported, right at 8,500 feet. So we're on our way, right? Now, I knew we could get into Las Cruces at this point because they have good instrument approaches there, no icing reported, and their weather was really quite good, uh, about a 1,000 overcast, 1,000 feet above the ground for the clouds. Um, and now the question was, could we somehow get to Almogordo? Now, as I mentioned earlier, their instrument approach at Almogordo requires going into restricted airspace where we're not allowed to go. And also, the only way to get to Almogordo from the south is through a very narrow, mile-and-a-half-wide, visual-only corridor that follows Highway 54. So we have taken this before in good weather where we could stay right over the road. But uh, we're on top of the clouds at this point with no breaks whatsoever in the undercast and no interest in getting a clearance to descend through them because this whole area is mountainous. So we didn't want to be down there unless we're on an approach that's protected. So as we got somewhat close to Las Cruces, I radioed Albuquerque Center and I said, we would love to get up to Almogordo if we can do that. Now, the cloud base on Almogordo was about 2,000 feet above ground and uh, good visibilities underneath. So I knew if we could get over to Almogordo and if we could get approved for this approach, we could get in there without any difficulty. But as I mentioned, there were a lot of obstacles between where we are at Las Cruces and landing at Almogordo. So I asked the controller, is there any way we can get an instrument clearance, meaning a cloud flying clearance from where we are, to Almogordo? And if we do that, can we get an approach? So she checked with the sector controller that handles Almogordo area, and he said, yes, the restricted area is not active at lower altitudes today, and I can get you the approach in there. The problem was that to get there on an instrument flight plan from the Las Cruces area, we would have to fly far to the east of our route, way out of the way, over the Pinion VOR, which is a navigational station, and then we'd have to go up to 12,500 feet to clear the Sacramento Mountains and then plummet down to shoot this approach in the meantime, I'm wondering, is the restricted area going to remain inactive? At this point, we're already like two and a half hours into the flight, and we're on top of solid cloud deck. So I said to the controller, how about if we stay under visual flight rules all the way to El Paso, and we fly the visual corridor, which we could do using our moving map? Could we then get an instrument approach into Almogordo because we have to have a way to go down through the clouds that's safe? So she did some checking with the other controller and said, yes, you can do that. Uh, he says that uh, you'll have to stay visual the whole way from here all the way until you clear the restricted airspace, the narrow corridor south of Almogordo. So you'll be virtually at Almogordo and then he can approve the approach. So that's exactly what we did. We flew above the clouds at 9,500 feet over toward El Paso. We talked to El Paso approach. We made a northerly turn into this mile and a half wide corridor and flew 60 miles north through the corridor, but we're on top of the clouds navigating this narrow corridor by looking at the boundaries on a moving map. And then when we got over near El Magordo, that Albuquerque Center controller gave us an instrument approach clearance to descend into the restricted airspace, which was inactive, then crossed the initial approach fix at 7,300 feet above sea level. And there was a course reversal through a holding pattern, which pilots will be familiar with. By the time we got down to the initial approach altitude, which was 6,000 feet above sea level, 2,000 feet above ground, as we were reversing course in the hold, we broke out underneath the clouds. We had beautiful, clear view of our destination. We completed the LPV approach for you pilots, but it was all in visual conditions. And we landed at Almogordo. 
and went to our event. I think most pilots will find this a pretty interesting flight. One of the things I've learned over many years of flying is you don't just plan a flight take off and then you don't have to think about anything until you get there very often. More often than not, things happen along the way that require planning, strategy, tactics to get to where you're going safely. And a big part of this, too, is being prepared to land at any point, right? To turn around, to land at an inconvenient place that might even be unattended. But if you're not willing to do those things, you cannot safely fly around in potentially marginal weather. So this was a a great flying adventure for me as a pilot because we did not know over the entire three-hour flight if we would be able to land at Almogordo until we got the clearance and completed the approach. Otherwise, we would have had to either fly 60 miles south again back to El Paso to land or go to Las Cruces, or if the weather had improved, fly north to Albuquerque and land up there if we had to. And that would have put us into a four-hour flight, at which point you're getting tired and physiological pressures are pushing. So, quite an adventure for a pilot. Thanks for riding along on today's Flying Carpet Adventure. Please help me continue this podcast by sharing your favorite Flying Carpet episodes on social media, posting reviews on your favorite podcast directories, and donating via my Greg Brown Flying Carpet website. Thanks in advance for your support. You can find photos from most episodes at my website, gregbrownflyingcarpet.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please check out my book of aviation adventure stories, Flying Carpet, The Soul of an Airplane, for which I was named Barnes & Noble Arizona Author of the Month. Learn about that and my other aviation books at gregbrownflyingcarpet.com. Also at gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, you'll find my views from the flying carpet aerial photography, available in fine art metal prints and pilot achievement plaques. Oh, and I'd appreciate hearing your feedback in my Flying Carpet Podcast Facebook group. Follow my social media sites, most of which can be found by searching Greg Brown Flying Carpet, and consider joining my student pilot pep talk group on Facebook. Thanks again for joining me on today's Flying Carpet Cockpit Adventure. Music by Hannes Brown. See you next time.